Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode number 28 of I Wish You Were Dead, a podcast about things that used to be alive, including occasionally people, not just animals and plants and, and things, uh, which is kind of what we're going to be talking about a bit today. Uh, because after we recorded last episode, which if you have not uh, seen or, well, seen, listen to, uh, this is a podcast. You're doing so great, Gavin. Keep it up. Um, if you have not listened going, to the last episode, <laughs> if you have not listened to the last episode, please make sure to, to check that out. Um, but Mike kindly offered, because I've been very busy, uh, to do another sort of Mike takes the wheel type episode talking about uh, more human history and dead people instead of just dead animals and things like I usually talk about. So Mike is going to be taking the lead sort of for this episode. And one of my favorite things about the uh, the episodes that I run is that Gavin doesn't have a clue what it is that I'm I have no idea about. what's happening. Usually, usually when, you know, pulling back the curtain here, a little fourth wall break, usually when, you know, Gavin's running the episodes, there's a whole list of notes and I'm kind of following along so that way it makes it a little bit easier for me to, you know, follow along with the episode. And there's some times where Gavin doesn't want me looking at certain things, but that's in general how it goes. Mm -hmm. Versus with uh, with me being in charge for our last Mike Takes the Wheel episode as well as today, Gavin doesn't have a clue what it is that we're talking about, which is, uh, it's always exciting for me to be able to bring a little uh, little razzle-dazzle to the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I really have no idea uh, who we're talking about, or I even if it's a person, it could be like a history event or something. I have legitimately no idea. Yeah, so this is actually going to be a, uh, you know, there's many different directions I could take this in future Mike Takes the Wheel episodes, but this is going to be a, uh, a bit of a lighter one, um, I believe. And this is going to be something that, um, you know, mixes together a number of my uh, favorite things. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, make sure you check the, uh, the description for the links down there. You can follow us on Twitter. You can read Gavin's blog. You can do all that kind of fun stuff. Uh, I was going to ask you about uh, Today in History, but we're not really, or Today in Science, but we're not really doing Today in Science. We're doing history, and so... Exactly. Uh, so, I well, I look through my calendar, as I do, to try and find something throughout the week that is in the vague realm of some kind of evolutionary biology, even, like, ecology stuff. So, like, definitely not just, like, paleontology, because I understand that's a really niche kind of field. Uh, but anything that I could talk about at some length with some kind of more knowledge than the general person. But this week was just kind of a dud in the calendar. And so I was like, well, Mike, since we're doing a, a history thing today instead of, you know, earth history, human history, um, why don't we do a history, you know, this week in history instead of this day in science? Uh, so what did we have for that? Well, so here's what happened is I was looking for, you know, something that happened. You know, we decided on this about five minutes ago. Yep. Um, and so I was looking for something that happened. And then uh, Gavin says, well, you know. Uh, Ulysses S. Grant died on June 23rd, 1885. And I said, perfect, we can talk about Grant. Um, and as I have his Wikipedia page pulled up, he died on July 23rd, 1885. Oh. So we are we are off by a month. However, um, luckily Ooh. for us, we do have a, uh, a backup here. Clarence Thomas, a, uh, a sitting judge, <laughs> a sitting justice on the United States Supreme Court, was born on June 23rd, 1948. And... Um, that's about all I want to say on Clarence Thomas. You know, that's that's really fair. Um, which <laughs> website... Let me find it. Which website lied to me? <laughs> uh, it was called historynet.com. Historynet.com. It well, lied to me. Apparently. So, uh, no offense to you, this is S. Grant, but we are, we are starting off on the wrong foot because of this, but that is okay, actually. <laughs> so, um, we are going to go ahead and get started, and I'm going to get started the same way that you tend to get started with me by asking you a, uh, a question. So Absolutely. Gavin, based on, I know that you are, um, you're not like a huge sports guy, but you know sports enough. Um, yeah. And I, I'm reasonably confident that you could answer this question. Okay. Uh, so Gavin, who was the first black baseball player in major league history? Oh God. Um, Like, to be in Major League? Yeah, like, the, right, the first black Major Leaguer. Was it Jackie Robinson? Yeah, so Jackie Robinson um, is a guy. He comes up and plays, I believe it was 1948 for the Dodgers. He plays um, in the Negro Leagues um, for a little while. He played 
at UCLA. He played, I think, four or five sports mm -hmm. in UCLA. And he's in, uh, and this is the reason why I knew that you would know this, is that he's in every history textbook um, as like the first black major leaguer. And one of the things that comes just a touch before the civil rights movement that, you know, is sort well, can of, I, can I take a pause here really quick to just yeah. say rest in peace to Chadwick Boseman. Yes. Yes. Ch who played him in the, uh, the movie 42, which was an excellent movie. So like that, sh that answer should have been out of my mouth quicker. Uh, <laughs> but so, I don't know. I felt like it was kind of a trick question, but anyway, just wanted to throw that out there. Rest in peace. Well, you're correct, Gavin. It actually was a trick question. So oh, Jackie okay. Robinson was not the first black major league baseball player, despite appearing in all of your history textbooks as such. Jackie Robinson was not the first person to play major league baseball. What Jackie Robinson really gets credit for is he broke the color barrier that had existed for, um, goodness, uh, about 60 years or so. I don't have the exact number in front of me, but about 60 years from the time there was the last major, major league baseball player, there was what was called the gentleman's agreement in, um, in major league baseball, where it was never formally written down as gentlemen's agreements tend not to be, but all of the owners in major league baseball agreed they would not hire any, and they would not sign any black players to play for them. Um, this is called the gentleman's agreement. Um, and it was, you know, helped enforced by Commissioner Kennesaw Mountain Landis, who, uh, who is probably more famous for his dealing with the Black Sox scandal. But that's not what we're going to talk about today. Okay. So today we're actually going to talk about two or the two or three players that came before uh, Jackie Robinson in being the first Black Major League Baseball player. So the first one, and this one is um, uh, is really interesting to me because we didn't know about this guy until. Um, like I believe it was 2007 was when he was first discovered is there was this guy named William Edward White who in 1879 played one game in the major leagues. He replaced uh, a first baseman, Joe Stewart, um, and played one game and went one for four. Can I, can I ask a quick, yeah, somewhat facetious question? Yeah, absolutely. They had sports in 1870. Yeah, and so no, that's, that's a great question. Um, and I should have, um, I should I kind, have, uh, like, I, I kind of think of those times as like, oh, people just kind of sat under a candle and read, you know, books that are like a million pages long, <laughs> and then went and tended the farm at 5am in the morning. And that was their day. No, that's, so that's uh, a great question. And so um, this gets into, this is part of the reason why I love baseball so much is because the history goes back um, so far. There was not the governing body, Major League Baseball. That didn't exist um, you know, at this time. And basically what's been done over the years is that historians, baseball historians, which is a real job title, um, have gone back and looked at different leagues that have existed over time and basically tried to figure out what was going on in those leagues, what was the level of competition, and crucially, in uh, William Edward White's case, as well as the other gentlemen we're going to talk about today, um, you know, whether they were, you know, major leagues, mm -hmm. which, you know, differs from a minor league, right, just you know, sort of the level of competition. And so um, generally, the first, um, the first team that gets cited as the first like professional major league team is the Cincinnati Red Stockings, who, <laughs> oh, okay, um, yeah, in, um, I believe it was um, 1869 was um, the first time they were just like, yep, we're going to play baseball players. And from there, that kind of sets off professional baseball. The origins of baseball are um, rather cloudy, uh, much cloudier than you may have heard, um, if you've ever heard of the name Abner Doubleday. But yeah, so there was, you know, maybe we once. have gone back. What was that? So I've maybe heard of heard that name once. Yeah, I'm much more heard... familiar with the start of like several other sports, actually. Like I know like uh, basketball started in Canada Right. relatively recently i know like something like lacrosse which is really big in like the northeast you know started as a native american sport absolutely um, and that's um it, it, for me at least what's interesting about baseball is that we have um decently good records actually going into the 1800s but it's still a little bit cloudy how baseball forms there was an english game called rounders and there was any number of other things um that wind up kind of starting 
um, you know, merging eventually into baseball. And even then, you know, just to be very, very clear, um, you're not entirely wrong. If you were to, you know, go back and watch the game William Edward White played in, it would not be baseball as we know it today. Right. I would kind of think just based on sort of my very limited knowledge of like other sports around the world that baseball, baseball would have been some kind of derivative of cricket. I would think that would be like the closest sort of comparison to like another modern sport today. Yeah, there is. Uh, I mean, there's cricket. There is. Um, there were a couple of variants of baseball. I think one was called the New York game and one was called the Massachusetts game. Um, there's any number of of different kind of hypotheses for how baseball starts. And they all, you know, it's one of those situations where, you know, they all have some amount of credibility. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's hard to say the only one that doesn't really is the, the Abner Doubleday myth, which has been rather thoroughly debunked and yet, you know, still kind of lives on in American popular culture. Interesting. So anyways, when it comes to William Edward White, um, he, based on the best research we can tell, he was probably the first black major league baseball player. I say probably, excuse me, uh, probably because just incredibly little is known about him, including for a hundred percent certain whether or not he was black. Looking at interesting, yeah, looking at census records um, from the time, it appears that his skin was light enough that he tried to pass as white. Um, it was able to do that, um, and we think you know, somewhat successfully. Although he basically disappears from you know from history after playing in this one game he was replaced the next game by someone who went on to be in the hall of fame again or order jim or um and the what makes it difficult to study william Edward right is just it is so difficult to try and figure out what happened to him mm -hmm. and and where he ended up um, going mm -hmm. you've got to kind of rely on census records and hope that nobody else has the same name william edward white which right. you know is you know again it's not that common, but it's common enough. Those are three rather common names. The one other fact I will mention about William Edward White is that, again, based on the best of our um, being able to figure out, you know, the best of our investigative powers, it's that it's quite likely he was the only former slave to play Major League Baseball. Again, he makes his debut in 1879. Right. That is, right, that is, you know, within a decade and a half of the Civil War. Well, you know, and, and that kind of tracks with... You know, a lot of other things happening, you know, because I was still, well, I guess 79 might not have, might have been at the very end of like Reconstruction. Yeah, so Reconstruction ends after the presidential election of um, 1876. Um, okay. There was a whole thing, Corrupt Bargain, um, Rutherford B. Hayes. It's a it's a whole thing. Um, so it had ended at that point, but still um, in the North, he was playing um, for the Providence Grays. Um, up in the North, you know, I, I don't want to, you know, whitewash history here. You would have had a bit of a better opportunity to play, which is actually what we'll see with the next um, person that becomes a major league baseball player. And the, really the subject of what I want to um, talk about today. So our current research suggests that you know, William Edward White was probably the first black baseball player, but he only played in one game. And there's even some debate about whether or not he should get that title, even if everything is true because he passed as white and may not have had to deal with some of the same obstacles as the next person that we're going to talk about, a guy named Moses Fleetwood Walker, who, uh, who was black and very much and very much owned the fact that he was black, as we'll see kind of after his playing career. And he that name definitely first. does sort of ring a bell. Yeah, if it rings a bell, um, it's probably, you know, if you've ever been around a baseball nerd and they've asked you the same question that I asked you at the beginning of this podcast, who was the first black baseball player? Usually they ask that question so that way somebody gets set up to say Jackie Robinson. And then they go, well, actually, it was Moses Fleetwood Walker, commonly called Fleet Walker. Okay. During his time. And he is the first um, black major leaguer to have any career of any kind of sustained length. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about him because he really leads... Um, sort of an interesting life, both on the baseball field as well as uh, when his turn is up to play baseball. So uh, Moses Fleetwood Walker, and if anybody has a chance to go to the Baseball Hall of Fame, there is um, uh, there is sort of a small mural of him in the, they have a whole section dedicated to African Americans throughout history uh, playing baseball. And there is a section dedicated uh, just to him as there well should be. Uh, but Fleet Walker, born in October of 1856. 
And he was a catcher who played for Oberlin College and then went on to go play for the University of Michigan. And while he was there, he gained a reputation um, as being this incredible defensive catcher. Now, Gavin, you're familiar with the um, with the catcher in baseball, right? I sure am. Now, when you're looking at a catcher playing baseball, what's one of the things that kind of strikes you most visually? All the padding and, and stuff. Yeah, so when if you ever watch a baseball game today, catchers have all this padding and equipment, and they're, you know, catchers still get hurt, you know, almost as often as anybody else on a baseball field, but they're, you know, they are protected as best as they can be. That was not the case for right. catchers the, at the time. This was still like, you know, the leather helmet football days. Actually, this was probably like 70 years before that. Yeah, yeah right. So exactly. like... <laughs> this, is, this is well before any of that. This is, you know... It was a combination of they didn't have the technology and you had to be man enough to go back there and take it. Right. Um, and so catchers were just routinely, um, uh, you know, beat up and injured. And Fleet Walker, through this, developed this reputation as an outstanding defensive catcher and a catcher that was able to hit just well enough. Um, he was not, by the best of our account, he was not like a great, great hitter, um, but he was a pretty good hitter who caught. And most of the time, if you were a catcher, you, you know, you didn't have much of a chance up there because your hands were always just sore from catching the ball barehanded. Right. Um, and so, but he develops this reputation. He goes to Oberlin College and then um, the University of Michigan. And then eventually, in 1883, he leaves the University of Michigan and starts playing for the Toledo Blue Stockings in 1883 in what was at the time considered a, um, a minor league. And so I believe that was, um, I don't remember exactly what league that was, uh, a Northwestern League team, it says here, which, um, again, a minor league team, just a, a league that, going back through history, just was not considered to be the upper echelon of gotcha. uh, baseball at the time. And so he plays for, uh, he plays in 1883, and he plays pretty well. And the next year, he still plays for the Toledo Blue Stockings. However, the Blue Stockings, and this is a thing that happens, you know, you know, early on in baseball's history, they actually change leagues. They go from the uh, that Northwestern League mm -hmm. that I was just talking about to the American Association, which um, doesn't exist today, but it was a major league. And that is okay. where we wind up getting uh, Fleet Walker as the first black major league baseball player in 1884. Interesting. And he plays um, for just about that whole season in 1884, catching for the Toledo... Um, the Toledo Blue Stockings. And once again, he was, he had this great reputation in over 84 as this fantastic defensive catcher. And I'm going to um, actually quote here from a guy named Tony Mullane, who was a pitcher on that team. And he's actually, um, he was a switch pitcher. He was able to throw both of his right and left hands. Um, weird. Which, yeah, right, very weird. There's one guy who's um, not very good, who I believe is playing minor league baseball now who was trying to do this, but he did this at the time. And this is a, you know, a quick content warning for a, um, a, a racial epitaph. Uh, not like, you know, the racial epitaph, but like quick content warning for anyone that. Um, but this is kind of what you had to go through if you were a black baseball player, if you were Fleet Walker playing in 1884, as good as you were. <clears throat> so Tony Mullane says that Fleet Walker was, quote, the best catcher I ever worked with, but I disliked a Negro and whenever I had to pitch to him, I used to pitch anything I wanted without looking at his signals, close quote. And so anybody who's seen a baseball game, you'll see the catcher putting mm -hmm. down, you know, two or one, you know, trying to call a pitch. So that way they're on the same page. And Tony Mullane, you know, had great respect for the player. He said, you look at Fleet Walker was as good as there is, but right. simply based on the color of your skin, I'm going to throw whatever I want and you're going to have to deal with it. And that's part of why. Tony Mullane winds up um, leading the league in wild pitches that year. And one of the injuries that Fleet Walker suffers is a broken rib in July of that baseball season. And that stays with him throughout the year. Well, cor correct me if I'm wrong here, just to sort of make a little bit of a point. So Toledo yeah. is in Ohio. Yes, I believe so. Yeah. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong here. Ohio is in the North. <laughs> um, yes. So, you're telling me it wasn't just the South that was racist? This is this is a point I like to make to my students um, quite frequently. To be very clear, like, if I were a black person, I would rather be in the North than the South. Um, That's However, fair. 
Yeah, right. However, like just because I would choose one over the other doesn't mean like one was good and one was bad. You know, there are there are many stories of many people that are seen as, you know, these great emancipators or, you know, champions of equality that you could look through and they're like, they didn't like slavery. That didn't mean that they thought that, you know, different races were equal. Right. And so that is um, that is a great point. And actually, um, another one. So uh, Cap Cap Anson, um, uh, Hall of Famer who played with the Chicago White Stockings or who managed the Chicago White Stockings. Again, Chicago North refused to play. Um, against um, against the Blue Stockings because, again, they didn't want to share the field with a black baseball player. That ended up um, resolving itself when the Blue Stockings said, if you don't play, you're going to forfeit this game and you're going to forfeit all the money that you would lose from this game. And as soon as money gets involved, right. Cap Anson backs down and says, okay, we will, you know, uh, you know we, we will play. Um, so he ends up playing just that one season in the major leagues. He had... Um, that broken rib, and that was actually a problem for a lot of the players on the Mud Hens, or pardon me, not the Toledo Mud Hens are the team today. The Toledo Blue Stockings were who gotcha. um, Fleet Walker played for, and he um, the team got so ravaged by injuries that his brother actually Welday Walker comes up and plays a handful of games for the team in 1884, making him the third Black baseball player um, to ever play. Interesting. Hmm. And so the you know so you have William Edward White. And you have sort of the, I don't want to say disputed case, but sort of the unknown surrounding that. And the next two black baseball players are Moses Fleetwood Walker and his brother, Welday Walker. And the fourth black baseball player is Jackie Robinson in 19, mm-hmm. uh, 1948 or 1947. I forget exactly which year. Um, but so these two brothers play in 1884. And then because of the crack rib that... Um, uh, that Fleet Walker has, he winds up being released from his contract at the end of the year. He never quite ends up uh, healing properly. Uh, even though he actually finishes in the top three in batting average mm-hmm. in 1888, he was, you know, he was hurt. And at that point he sort of goes on um, and plays for a few other teams in, you know, minor leagues throughout the country. And he plays for um, a bunch of teams, eventually ending his career in Syracuse which is not too far away. Oh, okay. Uh, which is you know basically where I live and you know not too far away from where you live. He ends his career playing a couple seasons for Syracuse and um, he did not hit particularly well. You can look up his statistics online and you can see that he was not, you know, at this point he was clearly at the end of his career and the injuries mm-hmm. had taken their toll, but he was still actually and this is something I'm, you know, quite proud of um, is that he was kind of a fan favorite in Syracuse and he was a team spokesman. He would be out in the community um, doing different things. Um, which is, you know, that's always something that I, um, I always kind of liked is, you know, growing up here, we have a little piece of history and actually, funnily enough, if you go take a look at, um, or if you live around the Syracuse area this Saturday, and this is part of the reason why I wanted to do this episode this Saturday for the Syracuse Mets is Moses Fleetwood Walker bobblehead day. Interesting. So if you, that's really yeah, this cool. Is, yeah, this is something that you're interested in. You can um, go to the Syracuse Mets game, which is the AAA team of the New York Mets, and you can um, get a bobblehead. I was um, I was planning to go to this game. I don't think I'll be able to go uh, at this point, but it is um, it is something great that uh, that the team is doing this year to try and honor you know some of its history. Now, this ends Fleet Walker's baseball career. Um, he is done after his second season in Syracuse, but that does not, uh, he still actually winds up leaving an interesting life. You know, a lot of times with different players, they, you know, they leave baseball and they sort of, you know, metaphorically walk back into the court and field. We don't really hear much from them. Um, after that, that was not the case with fleet Walker. And so, um, starting in 1891, can I, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Hit me. Is that an angels in the outfield reference? Um, that was a field of dreams reference. Okay. I don't actually know baseball movies, so I was I, like, I, I, "Angels in the Outfield." I'm like, "That's a baseball movie that I am aware of," <laughs> uh, and I also was aware of Field of Dreams, but it was not the first one to come to mind. Okay, yeah, it is. Yeah, you know, hypothetically walking back into the cornfield, just sort of like you know, kind of disappearing into history, and you know that is you know that is sort of the last that anybody ever hears of you. Not the case with Fleet Walker, so he stays in Syracuse for for a little while, and there's some things that happen over at Syracuse University. And then, crucially, in 1891, he kills a guy. So, uh, yeah, like, like, 
on purpose? Tell me but, more. Yes. Tell me yes. more. So this is right. This is where this is where things get interesting. This is um, if this was just a story of the first black baseball player, I probably wouldn't have um, brought him up on the podcast here. But he does so many um, other things. So again, he spent some time at Syracuse University with one of their professors. I don't quite know doing what. But then in 1891, he kills a guy. And the story here is, um, again, a, uh, a small moment of me being proud of Syracuse. <laughs> so um, a guy named a guy named Curly Murray, um, okay. he winds up uh, uh, approaching Walker and throws a stone at his head for some reason. I believe he was a bricklayer. He throws a stone at Fleet Walker's head um, and, so, and, you know, that sort of stuns Walker for a little bit. So what Walker does, as you do, is he goes and he stabs Murray with a pocket knife that he had on him. Uh, okay. Yeah. And so what ends up happening, so he's, he is arrested for murder. It was originally, um, charged as first degree murder, moved down to second. And Walker was like, I did it. Like, you, you know, you've got the right guy. He turns himself into the police mm-hmm. and he goes up for trial and he's like, Hey, look, this was self-defense. You know, you have, um, this other guy that was throwing a stone at me. I had to protect myself with self-defense. And if I told you normally, that there was an all white jury that was hearing this case, you know, you would normally think that he'd be found guilty, correct? Right. You would think so. But again, in Syracuse, New York, an all white jury finds Fleet Walker not guilty, you know, by reason of self defense. And apparently hmm. the, uh, the newspaper reporting is that there was much delight by the spectators <laughs> in the clubhouse because, uh, or in the courthouse because Fleet Walker had become, you know, such an instrumental part of the Syracuse community during that time. Hmm. So that is, uh, again, a, a story that sort of warms my heart just a little bit about Syracuse, knowing that um, they, you know, they embraced this, uh, this black man, um, regardless of whether or not he was a baseball player, they embraced this black man um, in their community, which, you know, makes me feel quite happy. Um, he does a number, number of other things. He winds up serving a year in prison later on for um, like mail fraud. I think he stole somebody else's mail. He serves a year in prison and he goes around um, after that and does a number of other things. He, um, owned several patents and ran several businesses of what, including, so, um, he owned a patent on a certain kind of like exploding, um, some kind of exploding artillery shell. Uh, oh, sure. I, yeah, that makes yeah, sense. And he tries to get, that yeah, he tries to get, um, a few other ones, um, as well. Um, I'm not entirely sure exactly, um, uh, exactly the other ones that he winds up getting, but that is sort of the, um, uh, the big one. And so, uh, again, he serves the year in prison because of uh, mail fraud. And he runs a number of businesses, um, a lot of times with his brother, Welday Walker, who, again, uh, mm-hmm. also played in the major leagues. These include things like hotels and running um, what are, you know, funnily named now Nickelodeons, which I don't know if you're familiar with this. But Nickelodeons were um, uh, different things that existed back in, you know, sort of like the early 1900s as these movie theaters where you could go pay a nickel and watch a, you know, a short movie, a short um, film that had been set up. Yeah. That like I, I had known the Nickelodeon. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like I'd, I'd heard of a Nickelodeon before and knew it was something else. Like I knew they didn't come up with that on their own. Who is it? Like Viacom, I think is the parent company that owns Nickelodeon. Yes. But mm-hmm. interesting. Yeah, I, I did not know, um, did not know this until I started teaching and, you know, I had to start teaching this era and I was like, oh my God, like that, you know, that makes so much sense now. You know, the Nickelodeon comes from mm-hmm. uh, this era of, um, of movies. And so he runs some of those um, rather successfully and he also um, gets into politics a little bit. And what he and his brother become um, really well known for is being, you know, large prominence of black nationalism and what was called the Back to Africa movement. Is that something that you're familiar with? Yes, I have, I have heard of that. Yeah, and so he, um, both he and his brother, Welde, um, you know, wind up doing a lot of writing and a lot of advocacy for um, basically that you know, black Americans, you know, were not going to achieve equality in this country and should um, go back to Africa, should form sort of their own state where they could, you know, be seen and treated as equals. He writes about this in a newspaper called the equator. And then he also wrote a book, which was, um, by all accounts, really well received, called Our Home Colony. I have tried to find a copy somewhere that I could buy and read myself. 
Mm -hmm. And I, for the life of me, can't find an actual copy of this. So if anybody happens to run across one, you know, email us. Um, but that's, you know, they end up, um, you know, they really end up working hard for these causes of black nationalism. And then eventually in 1924, at the age of 67, uh, Moses Fleetwood Walker ends up dying of pneumonia. Hmm. And I just, again, the, the reason I wanted to talk about Fleet Walker here um, is a, I want to do something a little bit different than just like guy in politics, you know, was cool. Uh, right. There's, right. There's lots of those stories. Uh, but also the first black major league baseball player to wind up you know, with a, any kind of a sustained career did so much more than just play baseball. There is, you know, records of fleet Walker doing so many different things, owning patents, owning businesses, killing a guy, serving a year in jail, you know, <laughs> for a different crime. Yeah. Right. For, yeah. Right. For a different crime. He's found innocent. That is, you know, that is nuts that by an all white jury, he is found innocent. And again, what, what year, somebody. what year was that? This was 1891. So this is post reconstruction. This is, right. uh, you know, Jim Crow is, you know, taking hold in the United States. And again, this was Syracuse, New York. So it is not, we are not talking about Southern Alabama. We are not talking about, um, you know, Dixie. But still, in the United States in 1891, you yeah. had you had somebody that you know, fully said, "Hey, look at you! Like, yes, I killed the guy. Like, you know, there's no dispute about that. The only thing is, you know, was this self defense?" And you know, the all white jury said, "You know, yes, this was self defense." And you know, by all accounts, the community was thrilled that um, that Fleet Walker was found not guilty for that reason. And that is just about all I have on. Uh, on Moses Fleetwood Walker. He is, again, a really interesting um, figure to look at. If you're somebody who's interested at all in the history of baseball or the history of, um, you know, the treatment of black, of, um, of black people, um, you know, kind of post post reconstruction in, you know, what's normally considered Jim Crow America, um, even though he you know, doesn't spend too much time in the South. Um, you know, Moses Fleetwood Walker is a great person to look at and just, you know, help understand some of the things that were going on at different times and sort of a different perspective than what you normally get. And also you can um, either impress your friends or annoy them by knowing that <laughs> Jackie Robinson was not the first uh, black major league baseball player, which when that movie 42 was coming out, I would tell anyone that would listen that Jackie Robinson was the fourth black person to play major league <laughs> baseball, not the first. That's really awesome. I'm, I'm really glad that you, that this is what you chose to, to pick for today. Also, uh, you know, because especially because this past weekend was Juneteenth. Absolutely. You know, the, the first, you know, national holiday celebration of, of Juneteenth. Uh, but no, this was this was really awesome. Thanks for bringing this to my attention, Mike. Yeah, this is this is the kind of thing when I'm teaching, I try to bring up, you know, when I can. Yeah, there's, you know, there's a lot of like political history. Um, that's really interesting where, you know, Senator does X or this president, you know, did something you wouldn't expect. But there's also, if you look hard enough, there's a lot of stories of just like regular people that never got elected to anything mm -hmm. that, you know, have these really cool and interesting stories. And I would, you know, you know, over the, uh, you know, over the course of my uh, teaching, I've tried to incorporate some of those when I can, just so that way, you know, it is possible to see you, you can be famous and do lots of fun things um, and be remembered without needing to be like elected and, you know, being Abraham Lincoln or anything. Hmm. Well, I, I really appreciate it. Um, is there, is there anything else that you would like to say about, about any of this weird fleet raggy walker. fleet walker? <laughs> I, was, I was just going to say yeah, this, Moses, this whole Moses topic, this, this whole topic is sort of what I was trying to find. A, a right uh, the phrase only, for, the but. only other thing um, I will, I will briefly mention, like I said, uh, Kennesaw mountain Landis, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we don't swear on this podcast, but you know, not a good dude. <laughs> um, and there is, if, if you, if you are someone that, you know, is like sort of likes history and also likes baseball, um, baseball is a wonderful sport that, you know, um, can really kind of meld those two because there's quite a lot of old timey history. And if you ever start looking into baseball, the old time names that exist are just, just absolutely beautiful. What some of these people actually went by. Um, you, we don't see <laughs> nicknames like that, uh, like that anymore. There was one guy whose name was uh, 10 million. First name ten, last name million. Like that was his. That was his actual name. 
that was I don't know if it was his name, but that was that was what he went by. There it All is. Right. Yeah, there and there's a thousand more uh just like that. <laughs> so um we will uh we will leave this here. This has been episode twenty eight of I Wish You Were Dead, a podcast about things that used to be alive and now people that used to be alive. <laughs> uh thank you, Gavin, for uh for letting me bring this to your attention. And we hope to be back with a regular episode next week where Gavin will be back in charge. Absolutely. Uh, see you all next week and happy Juneteenth, although slightly belated. Slightly belated, but uh, still deserved. Happy Juneteenth. Happy Pride Month, too. Absolutely. Happy Pride, everyone. Yeah, just happy, happy everything. <laughs> <laughs> see you all next week. <laughs>